So for over a few years now, I've been carrying out research on technology and the city in Kinshasa. And ever since I began to think about the relationship between technology and especially um, electronic devices, which I call machines. Uh, and this is actually inspired by my fieldwork in Kinshasa, a laptop or anything else, it's always la machine. So, um, so for this text, a machine, a machine is an electronic device. So ever since I began to think about the relationship between technology and society, I've been haunted by the question, could the novel of Frankenstein have been written by an African author? I understand that this might seem a puzzling question coming from an anthropologist, but I do think there's some fundamental social questions underlying this question. And in this presentation, I'm not going to give an answer, but I'm going to give, like, at the end I'll come back to this and I'll propose something um, that could be part of an answer. Now, so in this presentation, I start from the premise that each society is constantly negotiating and renegotiating the possibilities and challenges of invention, of creation, of things made by humans. And so as anthropologists, we need to take issue of that. We need to study that. And which means that we need to understand, or what is the object of our study, we also need to understand the cohabitation of humans with objects of their own making. And in order to, and so this will be the topic of this presentation, I'll bring in the, talk, the notion of the technology contracts in order to propose a particular way of studying this cohabitation of humans with objects of their own making. I'll do this based on a rereading of some classics in the library of our discipline, social and cultural anthropology, and combined with some recent writings in the fields. So I'm proposing a method, an analytical lens on societal dynamics related to technological invention. I'm interested in engagements with technological innovation, not only in the global south, Kinshasa happens to be my field of study, but um, also here in the global north. And my focus is on electronic modernity. This form of modernity that derives to a high extent from mathematical and computational thinking as developed in the global north, and but that governs many people's lives in intimate ways all around the world. All in all, electronic modernity is this era in which to a great extent knowledge acquisition and circulation depend on electronic devices. Information and communication technologies also offer unprecedented platforms of imagining and presenting the self. Just think of our various multiple avatars on social media platforms. But also mobility, movement of humans, goods and money is more and more electronic. Think about the smart cars and the electric, electric bicycles, but also the electric and electronic systems that structure air traffic, trains and boats. But also think about the global finance scape, which is only possible thanks to electronic communication. The global finance scape depends to the con on the constant connections between stock exchange markets in New York, London, Tokyo and elsewhere. But not only these classic spaces um, depend on electronic um, devices. Since a few decades already, electronic devices have been inserted in the organization of the Hajj from Indonesia to Mecca, as fascinating research by Bart Barendrecht in Leiden University shows. But also wider research on electronic modernity and Islam in India by, for example, Patrick Eisenbauer and in Indonesia by Martin Slama also shows how global centers, Dubai, Kuala Lumpur, and so on, play a fundamental role in transnational trade and Muslim global society, the Muslim global modernity. All these worlds, scapes as Apadurai would have it, thrive on their own rhythms and play with simultaneity and synchronization. All of these are nowadays literally impossible without the usage of electronic devices. So we need to take seriously how electronic devices anywhere, here and there, lead to confrontations between various knowledge systems, but also between cultural approaches towards control, mastery and intervention. The overall goal of my presentation 
is to shed an anthropological light on homo faber in electronic modernity. The notion of homo faber was a concept initially coined by the French philosopher Henri Bergson, indicating man the creator. This notion considers humankind as tool makers, tool users, workers and craftsmen. It is in L'Evolution Créatrice from 1907 that Bergson writes, human intelligence is the faculty of fabricating artificial objects, in particular tools and varying indefinitely in their fabrication, end of quote. The question, could the novel of Frankenstein have been written by an African author, is relevant as the Frankenstein story speaks ultimately about a living creature created by a human being, and this being overwhelms the creator, to, even to the extent that it threatens the survival of the human species. In electronic modernity, we have our own risks of Frankenstein. Last year, news, or was it fake news, came out that Facebook and Google both had to shut down certain systems of artificial intelligence as robots began to interact with one another in a language unintelligible to the developers. Interestingly enough, very quickly, Facebook and Google issued press statements in which they claimed that this was fake news and that this never had happened. Tech entrepreneurs vented their frustration on Twitter and various media platforms, accusing the journalists who had issued the initial reports, these journalists were said to be irresponsible and looking for sensation, and they should be ashamed. Artificial intelligence, the moral panic surrounding it, and the whole media circus embedded in it, are lived realities that provide exciting material for us as anthropologists to think through, to try to understand how human beings live with others, animate others, mechanical others. So mechanical others are included in this category of animate others that might become or that are already smarter than ourselves, than their creators. While this topic of artificial intelligence and machinery might seem far away from classic anthropological concerns, it is not. Ever since the beginning of our discipline, anthropologists have explored human and non-human interactions, usually religious, spiritual others. Mechanical and electronic modernity have introduced machines as significant others. In order to understand the cohabitation of humans with machines, I want to introduce the notion of the technology contract, as I said, as an analytical tool, a heuristic. This notion of the technology contract draws on Benedetta Jules Rosette's understanding of computer contracts, as she developed it in her ethnography, published in 1990, on computer education in Ivory Coast and Kenya, terminal science, computer and social change in Africa. Probably one of the earliest sociological studies of IT on the African continent. With computer contracts, Jules Rosette refers to the end of negotiations. So a contract finalizes, closes negotiations. The moment of a mandate of acceptance um, of, or a rejection of a particular machine. The contract, in her book, marks the moment at which the role of a machine in an enterprise in Kenya or Ivory Coast is clearly established. So this is what the contract does. It establishes the role of a machine in an enterprise. That role might be positive or it might be negative. So there's no place for this machine for this and this reason. That's a negative contract. A positive contract links everyday practices to success stories of computer-related practices. Drawing on Jules Rosette's definition of the computer contract, I understand the technology contract also as the outcome of negotiations that speak to a society's acceptance, refusal, or partial acceptance, or partial refusal of technological innovations. I argue that we need to attend to the various technology contracts that societies are negotiating. And so with negotiating, I'm referring to the whole discursive realm, negotiations, but also to the whole set of practices that surround negotiations of a contract. 
So I see contract as the end goal of a process, a process of experimenting with technologies, of experiencing the technologies, of reflecting about appropriate usage and so on. So this analytical attention then offers a heuristic into the social possibilities of technology. It allows us to move beyond utopian and dystopian representations of technology and society. In particular, such a perspective on the making of technology contracts allows us first to understand who are the main actors, who is involved you know, in technological innovation and the acceptance or refusal of technology and society. Who are the main actors in setting up this contract? What are the terms of agreement? You know, what are the idioms that are used? What are the expectations? What are the obligations? How are these negotiations framed? In which networks do these debates take place? Second, important questions to ask as well are how issues of trust and control, because every contract requires trust between the, part, the parties that agree on a contract, how are issues of trust and control experienced, described, maybe tested, validated, sanctioned? sanctioned? And then finally, how do masters and users relate to one another? What are the agree agreed forms of interaction between people who use the machine, the machine, and those who have commissioned, who have paid for the machine, who have installed the machine, who have ordered the machine? All in all, these questions are not new to the discipline. While the tools and technology have been studied ethnographically since a long time. So what I'll do, I'll, re I'll revisit some ethnographies and read them through the lens of technology contracts. At the end, I will bring in some reflections about the ethnographic praxis. Because as ethnographers, we're all familiar also with setting up technology contracts with our interlocutors. When we ask if we can record an interview, whether we can take pictures, actually these are ways of negotiating a technology contract. So at the end, I'll come back to that. The first part, masters. Who are the major players in a technology contract? Who are the masters of manufactured goods? Revisiting the anthropological literature on technology, it becomes clear that in certain societies, technology experts make contracts with the spirit world. Probably the best known technology expert in the Africanist literature is the blacksmith. In many African societies, blacksmiths are closely tied to ritual experts, and they offer, as they often provide the ritual objects. Sometimes they are ritual experts themselves. They can become healers, but they also can become chiefs because of alliances with spirits. The blacksmith is, in the study of technology, a crucial figure. In many societies, it are actually the blacksmiths that produce culture. It are the blacksmiths that domesticate the world. Um, I put this picture here to actually make a um, connection with the contemporary engineering world. This is a picture from Delft, from the Technology University in Delft. And their mascot or their emblem is Prometheus, um, the god that gave fire to humankind. So for the Delft University of Technology, Prometheus is their official symbol. Um, and Prometheus, of course, relates to blacksmiths, work with fire. The blacksmith, as I said, is an interesting figure because he brokers between the undomestic world, undomesticated world and culture, society. One of the most incisive ethnographies of blacksmiths is the Mande Blacksmiths, a monograph published in 1988 about blacksmiths in West Africa. Patrick Woodnorton argues in that book that blacksmiths and spirits are almost colleagues in the eyes of the Mande. So this book is about the Mande region, Mali, Burkina Faso, um, Niger. The blacksmith's task sent um, the blacksmiths often into the outside world, the forest, the world where spirits wander, and um, you can only survive after one has made alliances with spirits. That's already one level of a contract. Blacksmiths make alliances with spirits. These spirits are considered to be the masters of the undomesticated world, and I'm using undomesticated 
world instead of what is commonly understood to be nature, but the binary nature culture is a very Western modern discourse. So in order to avoid that kind of language, I'm using undomesticated worlds versus a domesticated world. Um, so spirits are considered to be masters of the undomesticated world, and success or even survival in this world of the non-human requires alliances with these spirits. So the technology contract at stake among the Mandic group depends on alliances between the blacksmiths and the spirits. The connections with the spiritual world, and especially the blacksmith's manipulation of fire energy, positions the blacksmiths and ambiguously in Monday society. The blacksmiths are part of what is called the Nyamakala group, and the Nyamakala group is a group term to indicate what we would call nowadays technology professionals. Um, these are bards, leather workers, sculptors, and the blacksmiths. They're all nyamakala, and nyama is the word for energy, but it can also be fire. Kala, kala means control, but it can also be like the handle of a knife. So, you know, if you, if you need to use a knife, you're not going to, you, you know where to put your hand on the handle in order to protect yourself. So, the bards, the um, sculptors, leather workers, and blacksmiths are all part of the Nyama Kala. They all control um, Nyama. Um, they all control the energy that animates the universe. So McNaughton shows us. Nyama is an energy that pervades in the world, but in human beings, it is also stored in animals and living beings. And this presence of Nyama then introduces a moral law, which is another kind of contract in Monday society. In order to, you need to protect yourself from the nyama of others. So in order to protect yourself from the nyama of others, you should never uh, do wrongful acts. You always have to prove that you're good, you're kind, you're humble, you're patient, you're, you're, uh, you submit yourself to others. So, the presence of Nyama is one of the most important parameters of hierarchy and society of social interaction. And these people of the Nyama Kala groups, they are the ones who are actually, who have privileged access to this, to this Nyama. Because of their privileged access and their work with the Nyama, blacksmiths are feared. And here we come at another dimension of technology use. The display of expertise over materials can induce fear and awe. It separates those with knowledge from those with no, without knowledge. It introduces dynamics of power, distinction, and authority. And we can make some maybe provocative parallels with electronic modernity, with contemporary society, which is, as Max Weber once put it, governed by the spirit of capitalism. This spirit, the law of accumulation of capital, underlies the Industrial Revolution and generates various technological innovations, of which mobile money nowadays captivates much research. How are contemporary electronic innovations related to this deep, untamable force, the spirit of capitalism, that governs national and international markets, investment schemes, and industrial innovations in many parts of the world. Should we consider Elon Musk's recent and very public breakdown, in which he claims he hardly sleeps anymore, is constantly awake trying to adjust the programs for the electric Tesla car, should we understand this as sacrifices to the spirit of capitalism? Are the accidents with the first automatic cars leading to various human casualties are these human sac sacrifices to the same spirit of capitalism? For all we know, Elon Musk is a visionary, someone who sees more than others. To use a familiar trope, a witch, who produces his witchcraft, which, as most of us know, requires sacrifices, part of a contract with the spirit of capitalism. Now, technolog technological creativity 
doesn't only occur within the workshop of the blacksmith or in the lab of the engineer. Rather, ethnographic research also indicates how religious spaces become spaces of technological experimentation. And here I want to refer to a recent book that came out this year, in May, um, The Cow in the Elevator, uh, written by Tulasi Srinivas. It's an, intertwinement, uh, it's an exploration in the intertwinement of the technological and the theological. So in this recently published book, Tulasi Srinivas recounts about the construction of a robotic divi. divi. So Devi is a female god in Hindu, uh, a female Hindu goddess, and the the scenography is set in the city of Bangalore, the IT city of India, where innovation is at the heart of the city's public sphere and ambience. She argues the culture of the city of Bangalore, and here I quote her, is oriented aspirationally around new technologies and the skills required to create them. End of quote. One of the opening scenes of one of her chapters um, it begins with a scene in which the robotic DVI was presented for the first time to the audience. And um, so one of her interlocutors, whose name is Vishwanatva, had been working secretly on this mechanical apparatus. Uh, and so she describes how then one evening the robotic DVI became uh, introduced to um, the community and she writes, the goddess could lift her right arm high. In her raised hand, she clutched a shining tinfoil trident, while at her feet lay a papier mache image of the buffalo. Its severe head, so of the buffalo, smeared with red ink. Light bulbs within the sanctum flashed, and the right arm of the deity thudded down, causing the trident to strike the buffalo's body. On the opening evening, as the assembled devotees were observing the wonder of technology, they gasped audibly in sheer delight. Children burst into scattered applause and laughter. End of quote. Srivanas emphasizes how, how what she calls the dynamic of wonder sits within the city of Bangalore. And it seems to be important for our notion of technological contracts. The technological apparatus that she describes is embedded in a society that, as she says, enjoys rather than issues technology and engages with technological apparatus and the ethos of newness. Now there's a fascinating twist in the usage of technology or the creation of technology by so-called amateur experts versus the engineers in India. There's a concept in India which is jugat. Uh, which is colloquially speaking innovation, but it's a Hindi concept referring to innovation. Um, and we can describe it as frugal engineering. There's an anthropologist Beatrice Jorigui, or I don't know how to pronounce her last name, in an, in, in an article published in 20, 2014, an American ethnologist who defines Jugat as goal oriented improvisation as especially the usage of informal social networks to advance, to advance one's interests. But it's also conceived as necessary for getting by. Now this concept of Jugat is also used to indicate uh, invention, creation, fabrication. It suggests that a practical solution is sought for an everyday problem. And Srinivas, um, describes this jugat, this search for the solution, in the following way. It is by circumventing the problem, uh, but still by being focused on what you want to get at, that you're trying to find a solution. So you're not like an engineer or a mathematician, you're not going to you know, break down the problem and try to you know, render every part of the problem you know, unproblematic and thus come to a solution. No, you're going to circumvent it. I have a, um, an image here of what Jugat... So if you click on YouTube, Jugat, you find a lot of clips. So this is a screenshot of uh, one of the YouTube clips of Jugat. So Jugat in this sense is, you know, we can call it a hack. 
an ad hoc hack. And here we see a man who is selling a roasted corn on the, on the roadside, but he, you know, he's getting older and in order to keep the fire going, he actually, you will see the YouTube clip, uh, he's, he constantly has to do like this to keep the fire going, but he's getting older so it's getting tiresome, so he has invented something, he has installed a small ventilator above the fire. So he does, so this ventilator is doing that. This is an example of Jugat. Of course, the, in the engineering world and in the business world, Jugat is perceived in a negative way. It's looked down on. It is, you know, it's frugal engineering. Now, says Srivinas, in the religious context, Jugat is applauded when it allows people to enter into an other realm of reality. If it can remind people of their ties to the universe, um, if it can render the individual aware of the intersubjective ties to the universe. And this is the central animating principle of Hindu philosophy. So that's why people were applauding and cheering for the robotic divi. People, people who were looking, on, were looking at robotic divi were suddenly um, in an augmented state. They were reminded in a more forcefully way of you know, their ties to the goddess. And here, this is what she then calls technology becomes theology. Um, it brings to the forefront a new reality in which the present becomes invigorated with new and joyful potentialities for change, expansion, and transformation. So we can argue that a technolo technology contract within the Hindu world requires that the creation, the robots, or any other technological invention for that matter, allows for a transformation, the creative augmentation of mundane reality, the production of wonder. Um, then, Jugat is encouraged. Now, the technology contracts that I've just discussed bring in, so they're related to the spiritual world, they bring in particular configurations of nature and culture. I've been giving examples of um, religious societies, religious worlds, but also secularized society has, through technological invention and creation, reconsidered um, the interactions between nature and culture. As was shown with the blacksmiths, um, the bush, the wilderness, or the world of spirits is a dangerous space. Cautionary tales exist about keeping one place in the world, in culture, and only certain people can venture into that dangerous world of nature. Now, modernity brings its own spaces of danger and risk. Danger and risk come with electronic and mechanical modernity from culture itself. Think about trains and guns. Death, you know, uh, accident by train or a tram um, happen all the time. These are not accidents that are caused by nature. And sometimes then nature becomes a safe space, a place to hide out, as so vividly described by historic Caperton Mavunga in Transient Workspaces, a historical ethnography of technology in southeastern Zimbabwe. He gives a historical account of technological transformations in Zimbabwe, uh, pre-colonial, colonial, post-colonial, post -colonial, we can discuss you know, the, the rubrics, um, but he shows how with, you know, with colonialism and with tourism, for example, as well, new technologies came in, which all produce their own dangers, which all opportunities as well, of course, but also they can produce death as well. Every society, every era delineates its own demarcations between the tamed and the undomesticated, between safe and unsafe spaces. And culture heroes are the ones that cross these dangerous lines. Now, as I've just said, new configurations between nature and culture through the intervention of technology have recently also appeared in secularized societies. For example, the maker's culture and fab lab spaces, fab lab coming from fabrication laboratories, 
which first appeared in the US in the 1970s as part of the hippie movement, speaks to the desire of establishing a transformed relationship between nature and culture. The onset of the US-based maker's culture rejects modernity's claim that the human dominates nature, that the human is the master of nature and that the human is in control. This is similar language as pronounced in the Anthropocene movement nowadays and the ecological turn, of which both generate technological innovations in order to protect nature. So that's a significant reversal of the first case study. All over the world, we observe how maker spaces are reconfiguring material worlds, literally designing the environment via ad hoc, cheaper, though inventive and innovative hacks. And you see all over the world nowadays, hackathons are being organized. In its essence, the, sorry, the movement of fab labs and maker spaces collides with a, with a do-it-yourself trend, which also conquers the global south through activities initiated by, by international embassies, at the forefront the American and the French embassies, but also other brokers between the global north and the global south, including NGOs and also returnees from the diaspora. In its essence, do-it-yourself culture refers to organized and self-conscious practices of building, modifying and repairing things without the direct intervention of experts or professionals, without engineers or without you know, people with high degrees. This movement, do-it-yourself culture, provides an alternative to the modern consumer's culture where the spirit of capitalism dictates the primacy of engineers, industrial designers and automated systems. In these worlds of maker spaces, fab labs and do-it-yourself cultures, waste, a cultural and political category in its own right, becomes redesigned, refashioned and reused, repurposed. Waste, the negative of modern man, or pollution, of the negative of modernity to invoke, um, sorry, waste which doesn't belong to modernity, which is pollution to, if, to invoke uh, Mary Douglas here, gains in a do-it-yourself cultures, the fab labs and the maker spaces, new value, new meanings. Now these maker spaces, as I said, they originated in secularized societies, especially in the US, and they travel now, this is a form that travels all over the world, and they become locally appropriated uh, when they are localized elsewhere. For example, in India, these maker spaces and do-it-yourself movements marry easily with the culture of Jugat that I just mentioned. Sorry. The local appropriation of maker spaces in other areas also means an additional reconfiguration of the relationship between nature and culture at times. So uh, this is then a secondary configuration of the binary of nature and culture. And here I want to refer to a research done by Ron English and Ellen Foster um, in a book chapter that they published this year, in which they talk about Senegalese and Ghanaian maker spaces. And they, they, they interviewed um, uh, people working in the maker spaces, which are very often situated in markets. And um, so they, um, they, they quote one person who works in Dakar on the Kolobane market, and actually that person combines the idea of the maker spaces with the idea of the spirits of the markets. He says a repairer can only carry out his work if he has pleased the spirit of the market. So in, Senegal, in, their, in, their art, in their book chapter, they indicate how maker spaces then become inserted in spiritual worlds that have their own configuration of the domesticated and the undomesticated of nature and culture. Now let me move on to the gendered dimensions of all of this. Contracts with, spiritual, with the spiritual world at times mitigates the male expert's power. In the Onitsha market in Nigeria, for example, car repairs are working on broken down cars and motor trucks. Now, in order to be able to do their work, they, they need to negotiate contracts with the women of the Onitsha market 
in order to be able to carry out their work. These women themselves have contracts with the spirits of the markets and need to carry out sacrifices of their own. That's one dimension, one gender dimension. Now, also the team producing traffic robots in Kinshasa, and some of you might have heard about um, a group of female engineers in Kinshasa who produce traffic robots like these. The, fact, the truth is, they are not all female engineers. You see, my picture only shows men. Um, so, the team is called an all-female team, despite the fact that most of the workers in the lab are male. Their emphasis on women giving life to these robots coincides, coincides with recent attention to gender politics of NGOs and international organizations that want to draw girls in the global south to the STEM sciences, to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So on the one hand, one can say this is a very clever marketing, a way of marketing so that they can team up with you know, um, uh, communities that are gender sensitive. However, I think there is more to that. I think there is a deeper connection between the idea of women giving life and technological creation, technological creativity. Is it a coincidence? that the novel of Frankenstein was written by a woman, Mary Shelley. Is it a coincidence that the robotic diva that I talked about, that Srinivas interlocutor produced a robotic diva, a female god, instead of a robotic male god? What does it say when the Black Panther film positions Okoye as the head of intelligence, the general of the army and the leader of the all-female security force protecting Wakanda? This deeper connection between women and the origin of technology creation and expertise becomes apparent in, ethnographic, in ethnographies about technology in Africa, especially when reading closely linguistic and ritual descriptions. As an example of linguistic descriptions, I refer to the already mentioned book Transient Workspaces by Clapton Mavunga. In Shona, one of the languages that he works on and with, um, spoken in Zimbabwe, as Klapperton Mavunga writes, the word for expert is Vamazviko Kota, which means mother, I'm sure I didn't pronounce this in the right way, I apologize, but, um, which means mother of a hyena. But it also indicates a woman of talent. And it stems, as he says, from the way in which Young hyenas go everywhere with their mother, who weans them only after their instruction is complete, and, after, and then they are free to take care of themselves. This Shona word for expert embodies also all kinds of expertise. Men who know how to build a house very well, women who know how to produce ceramic pots very well, speakers, um, who speak very well in public, hunters who are prolific, smiths who do their work in an extraordinary way, all of these are called famas vikokota, or mothers of hyenas. For an example of ritual descriptions, I turn to the work by the late Stefan Weckart, who carried out ethnographic research among the Sakata community in Northwest Congo in the mid-1990s. He, he described for Sakata blacksmithing, he says, the semantic construction of iron working among the Sakata contains a metaphorical transposition of human procreative activities. There is a striking resemblance between iron work and sexual work. The smith is a kind of obstetrician, helping to deliver the iron. What is at stake? is the appropriation by men of female reproductive power. The male blacksmith succeeds in manipulating the female reproductive forces instead of being taken by them. He becomes a cultural hero, mediating between human and superhuman, between male and female, between culture and nature. He is a very powerful sorcerer who appears to control the power to give and to take life. Another example 
Oh, the video didn't work, so I have a show. But um, that draws on fieldwork of one of my previous professors, Renate de Wisch, who did research among the Yaka community, also in Congo. Blacksmiths appear in healing rituals, and they actually reintroduce the widows back into society after a mourning period for their husbands. A widow among the Yaka community can only re-enter society after a blacksmith has brokered between the world of the dead, to which she belongs because her husband has died, and the world of the living. At the end of the mourning period, the widow has to visit the blacksmith's workshop. The fire of the blacksmith literally blows new life in her body. It chases away the soul of her deceased husband. When the blacksmith visits the hut in which the widow is secluded, she needs to crawl through his legs and then can abandon the hut, hut which has been built for their marriage. Then a new face, a new life can start for this woman. So what does it mean if women or female actors, as we can consider these blacksmiths, um, what does it mean if women become significant mediators for the technology contract? Does it mean that when women are involved in the production of technology, that these tools and machines become easier accessible? As they are, are they then easier associated with societal production, reproduction, renewal? And do they show possibilities for viable new futures? Are women the real masters of technology and of invention? These observations and reflections unsettle the taken-for-granted associations of technology and masculinity. And I think as anthropologists, we need to provide deeper genealogies of the gendered configurations in the technology contracts that society set up, revise, dispute, and renegotiate. Actually, one of the most exciting stories of the history of the computer shows that women were the first human computers. American female mathematicians were collaborating with the first electronic machines, the first computers, during the Second World War. They were calculating, refining the accuracy of weaponry, doing ballistic analysis, ballistics analysis. So these women were not only the masters of the computers, they worked in tandem with the computers. They were the computers themselves. There's also an interesting documentary about this history of the computers. In the second and much shorter part uh, of the talk, I aim to look deeper into the ways we can in, in which we can interpret negotiations. So, so far, I have looked at the main actors of technological invention, inventors and masters. Negotiations can take the form of heated debates, of moral panics. But however, usually these negotiations are more banal and they lead to gradual acceptance of innovations, a gradual insertion of technologies in daily lives. And I want to refer here to a book written by a monography um, written by Ilana Gershon, came out in 2010, Breaking Up 2.0, Disconnecting Over New Media. An exciting study of breaking up over Facebook among students on campus of Indiana University in the United States. Shio Gershon here offers, um, and some people know this book probably, Gershon offers an incisive account of how people adapt to new technologies, from the written letter, over the fax, over the email, to Facebook posts, messenger and WhatsApp messages. Gershon observed how these technologies, these innovations in communication infrastructures, each time present people with a new range of social problems. Some of these problems are, is it appropriate to break up over a WhatsApp message? Should children allow their parents to become their Facebook friends? And we all can imagine other dilemmas that pop up. So as these dilemmas, as these questions appear, people also look for solutions for these problems. People develop new skills. For example, it is by arguing over a text message, over something, 
that there is meta language coming up. Like this is not the appropriate space to discuss this. And another person responding, no, I've already done this. So that's how new idioms of practice. So Gershon introduces the notion idioms of practice are coming up, are figured out on the morally and socially appropriate ways to use different media. By observing and talking to people, they come to a consensus, how to behave or how to interact over this new technology. It is here, in reaching this consensus, that it, which is a particular form of contract, that what Gershon calls idioms of practice are established. These idioms of practice are the outcome of engagements with new forms of technology, of explorations of what new technologies allow one to do, how they can and should act upon the world, and they are also the outcome of social reflections on appropriate inter social interaction through technology. Now, these idioms of practice, we can observe them anywhere. Um, and I want to come back to the book, uh, Cow in the Elevator. Um, each time a new technology comes up, idioms can be revised and either rejected, extended, or confirmed. And in a fascinating example is a description that um, Srinivas gives in her book. So her fieldwork for a cow in the elevator took over, 20, uh, took over 15 years. She started in 1993, and I think her last fieldwork was yeah, even late, 2013 or 14. And she says in the beginning, she was not allowed, so it, in the 90s until the early 2000s, she was never allowed to take pictures of the statues of the Hindu deities in Bangalore. And so through the, ninth, through the 90s, early 2000s, so during fieldwork, she was always learned that she should point her camera away from the deity for fear of photographing the gods. It was not done. However, in 2013, 2015, the um, by the time social media became popular, Hindu priests and healers were actually encouraging taking of pictures of um, the deities and they were actually allowing live Facebook screening in temples. So while in the mid-1990s until 2000s, the technologies themselves were considered to cause, um, to fragment attention, to distract people from worshipping, um, nowadays, Hindu leaders have started to embrace and uh, to embrace the new technologies. So idioms of practice have been renegotiated. Um, the technology contract changes over time. And I move on to a final characteristic of the technology contract, which is that with any contract, technology users have to trust the other or the others with whom the contract is negotiated. Here we come at the issue of trust, control, and balance. Usage of, Usage of machines requires trust in the machines, but especially trust in the engineers, the designers, trust in those also who have ordered the machine. And the latter can be spirits, gods, but they can also be political actors, economic actors. The machine itself, the designers and the producers, also including those who have commissioned the machine, are each in their own ways masters of the machine. An example in case regarding users of distrust, uncertainty, lack of trust in the masters of machine is provided by an ongoing controversy regarding voting machines in DR Congo. The country is headed towards a new phase in its political culture. By 23rd of December this year, uh, the current government should have organized um, elections, democratic elections. So the state is also technologically preparing the presidential and provincial deputies elections uh, at the end of the year. The government has ordered voting machines designed and assembled in South Korea. Ever since the inhabitants of Kinshasa learned about the fact that South Korean voting machines would be inserted in the upcoming elections, 
and that was already in February this year, people have been expressing skepticism and doubt about the machine. On September 3, 3rd, and now recently, the Lucha, a protest movement, took to the streets against these voting machines. If anyone is on Facebook or WhatsApp and has Congolese contacts, you get pictures and you get memes of people saying, don't trust the voting machine, um, it's, um, it's, it's a scam. So through gossip and online, people literally also write against the usage and they share conspiracy theories. It is not so much the machine itself that is distrusted. It is, rather, what is distrusted are the makers, the producers, the various masters. Quinoa, but I think in extension many in Congo, so that will be up to Silk to confirm, Quinoa doubt that the machine will do its work as it should be intentionally designed, meaning the voting machine is supposed to transmit the vote that the voter um, has uh, indicated via fingertip in all privacy and with confidence that so with the fingertip her choice for presidency and members of parliament is transmitted via the voting machine. That's how the voting machine should work and that's what we expect it to do. However, in Kinshasa it's commonly held that these voting machines actually will, are overruled by those currently in power. People assume that they want to rig the elections, want to remain in power, and so that these voting machines are merely, will be, because uh, this has not been proven yet, it's about expectations. We are, we, literally people are now setting up this technology contract with the state. So they expect that um, the agency of the makers, uh, that the voting machine will merely act out the agency of the makers which is the amalgam of the commissioners and the engineers. There is no magic or spirituality in this story. Though what is understood is, and here I'm applying Alfred Gell's social theory of art, what Kinoa, well, so what the anxieties of the inhabitants in Kinshasa imply is that the voting machine is a container of distributed personhood, in which the agency of the user, the voter, is downplayed even to the extent annulled by the intentions of those who have commissioned the machine, the ruling elite. Now, it is important to emphasize that this distrust in the machine is not typically Congolese or African. Um, this is, I don't know if we have time to show this, but this is, um, uh, these are two screenshots of a, um, of a video that um, circulates nowadays among the Congolese blogosphere, but it refers to the American elections of a few years ago. Um, so also there, uh, there, is, there was a problem in setting up the technology contract. So trust, or the lack thereof, relates to perceptions of intentions of the masters regarding the user's well-being. Trust goes beyond trust in the machine itself. Trust, rather, is an intersubjective experience that projects intentions and purposes to the makers, creators, and sponsors of technologies, of the created object, of the machine. The machine literally is a mediator between various social actors. So bringing back the story to the technology contract, this controversy about the voting machine in Kinshasa, in particular, in particular, the refusal of the machine is a story in which lack of trust in the machine is a metonym of lack of trust in the government. It is not a refusal of the technology as such. Rather, it is a refusal of the acceptance of the masters of the machine as trustworthy partners in the negotiations of the technology contract. So to conclude, I'm, I would like to dwell a few minutes, I, still, I hope you're still with me, I would like to dwell a few minutes on how the technology contract also shapes our own practice, especially our fieldwork. When recording our conversations, taking pictures, filming, typing notes on our computers, we rely on technological objects for the storage of our data 
impressions and initial reflections. While carrying out field research, we are constantly setting up technology contracts with our research interlocutors. This can happen implicitly, but very often this happens very explicitly. Indeed, best practices in our discipline also include negotiations with our interlocutors about these machines, about who will have access to these machines, and to the archives that they carry. Sometimes, the outcome of these negotiations may be clear rejection. At times, indeed, it is impossible to use electronic goods during fieldwork, for example, when working on politically sensitive data. And for those who have done fieldwork already, I can imagine that you will agree that very often our interlocutors are very well aware of the possibility of extending their personhood via technology to powers either close by or far away that may harm themselves or those in their vicinity. Probably one of the best known, but probably also the most exoticizing technological differences is captured in the notion of soul theft. When conducting archival research in the Africa Museum in Tavurin a decade ago, I read in a footnote of a missionary's notes that when he wanted to tape a conversation with a newly married couple, so that was somewhere in the 30s or 40s of the previous century, the couple did not allow him to record the conversation on tape as the spouse was afraid that her voice, which is a manifestation of her invisible body, would wander around and connect to material and spiritual worlds unknown to, unknown to her, thus beyond her control. Renate Wisch, who I already mentioned, one of my professors at the KU Leuven, told me how, during his initial fieldwork among the Yaka communities in Western Congo, between 1971 and 1974, it took him about four to five months to gradually introduce the tape recorder. He asked children to tell stories which he recorded, through which he learned the local language, but also gradually the Yaka community became familiar with the unfamiliar device. As researchers, indeed, we often bring advanced technological equipment into communities that are not familiar with these devices. And thus, we project ourselves as more technologically advanced, or technologically more advanced. Of course, research among technology community, communities, as I am doing nowadays, uh, last August I was in Kinshasa to work with people who produce apps for mobile phones. I don't know anything about this. So, they are, you know, I'm um, technologically less skilled than them. Um, so research among technology communities like engineers or tech experts drastically transforms the relationships between, you know, the anthropologist and the expert. Um, I'm very, very much an apprentice in this world. Um, nevertheless, we need to constantly negotiate what we will and can do with the technologies and the data retrieved via these technologies. If our interlocutors seem to worry that their digital or electronic selves, even if it's only in an acoustic form, can provide access to their self or their person, then we're obliged to include in the contract how the technologies will be handled. I already mentioned that politically safe, political safety is one of the more obvious reasons why technology could be off limits at a certain moment in fieldwork. Other reasons, such as religious dictates, can be part of the technology contract as well. Let me bring in an anecdote of fieldwork. A few years ago, I accompanied a young woman, the daughter of my host family, to her church in Kinshasa. And as often happens in Kinshasa, one of the major signs of practices of respect that you can show to a person is to accompany him or her to his or her church and let him or her introduce you to their spiritual father. That day, I had forgotten my notebook at home, but I had my phone with me. So, uh, during the service, I began to take notes in my smartphone. After a while, the ushers came up to me and they asked me to stop surfing on the internet. I was not surfing on the internet. And they told me, you've got to listen to the word of God. I tried to explain, listen, I'm, you know, I'm very concentrated and I'm doing like all these next to me, they're just writing with a pen and a notebook, I'm typing with my finger in my phone. To no avail, and after half an hour, I was asked to leave my seat 
and to go and explain myself. While the service was going on, I was asked to go and explain myself to one of the sub-pastors. And I was not allowed to return anymore to my seat. So my sister had to wait there with my stuff until the end of the service. This incident is relevant for the discussion of a technology contract and the relationship between masters and machines. In the moment of their refusal of my iPhone as a tool in fieldwork, I could not negotiate a technology contract. I was reminded about the technology contract thriving in the space of the Pentecostal church, which means usage of electronic technology is allowed within the unidirectional relationship of the sacred words flowing towards the believers. Because in these churches, you've got a lot of electronic equipment, screens with Bible verses, cameras, sound blasters, so, but they should be oriented towards the church community. Um, so the users are, the recipients are the believers, while it are the pastors who are in control of technological machinery. It was the, so the believers are users in this contract, not masters. And an appropriate attitude is to perform servitude, to be recipient of sacred messages. And it was my performance of handling a technological tool that became a problem. If I would have taken the same notes in a notebook, it would have been fine. But there would have been no doubt that I was listening to the word of God. Rather, the mobile phone has an intimate object that obscures the sounds and images that the user is watching and receiving became a competitor for one's attention that should be oriented towards the sacred. The unspoken technological contract in this church is, as was shown to me by me removing me from the site, believers listen and remain as open and receptive possible to the sacred sounds and words. The conflict also indicated a second relationship, that of master-apprentice. I really was an apprentice, and the ushers in church were in power. I was reminded as my, about my role as a student, as someone interested in religious practice, and respecting that role, I should comply with the technology contract in place and not try to change it. So I think what, what it reminded me of is that there are various technology contracts constantly at play within the various social groups that we are visiting and that we bring along as well. And I think this is one of the things that we need to do more in our discipline is we need to attend more to the various implicit and explicit understandings about what appropriate technolo technology usage is. And we should also be attentive to um, our own assumptions of what appropriate technology usage means and sometimes understand that this can interfere with other ways of how technology is valued and used. These understandings need to be rendered explicit in our studies as these not only shape to a large extent our interactions with our interlocutors but these also determine what kind of data we can collect, archive and later on use for analysis. So, I have not provided an answer on the provocative question of whether a Frankenstein could have been imagined by an African author. What the Frankenstein story commonly recounts is a loss of human control over its own creations. Yet, is the real problem of Frankenstein not that in this novel there is no technology contract? that the Homo Faber did not render the invention socially relevant, and thus that there were no negotiations taking place that could revise a technology contract at all times? As I have tried to argue here, technology contracts are all around, sometimes they're broken, and as scholars we have to constantly observe how people's expectations of technology and positions of masters, users, are reconfigured at various times. Thank you.